This is Colin Edwards. At 9 a.m. on Thursday, March 7th, I went down to the Alameda County Courthouse to cover the preliminary to the trial of the young Black Panther leader, Huey P. Newton, who was accused of the murder of one Oakland policeman and the wounding of another, charges which Mr. Newton vehemently denies. For the first time at a court appearance of Mr. Newton or any other Black Panthers or young radicals, I was barred from entering the courthouse for lack of a police pass. Also excluded were a French news photographer and a People's World photographer. So I didn't get to see Mr. Newton in court. However, an hour later I was able, to my surprise, to record Mr. Newton in the detention quarters on the 10th floor as he talked with three American reporters and myself, and his lawyer, Mr. Charles Gary. Mr. Gary had earlier brought me up to date on the status of Mr. Newton's case when I was finally admitted to the courthouse after the trial preliminary had ended and after Mr. Gary had held a press conference on the fourth floor. Uh, Mr. Gary, I was, I was kept outside the courthouse until now. Could you very quickly summarize it for KPFA, the situation as of now? The situation as of now, the court has uh, picked a trial judge, Judge Monroe Friedman in, de in Department 8. The case has been set for trial on May the 6th, 1968. Has there been any change in the situation with regard to the charges? Have they dropped any charges? Have they brought up new evidence? Have they shown you any evidence? No, they have not dropped any of the charges. We have a substantial amount of the so-called evidence, uh, but we do not have the list of the witnesses so that we can interview them and be able to prepare for this case. Uh, and normally, the defense is given these things, uh, the names of witnesses, are there? Normally, they're given those uh, names uh, if the defense attorney makes the proper motions, and we have made the proper motions. Before meeting Mr. Newton, and indeed before I even knew I could interview him, I met his sister and his fiancée. Now, because members of Mr. Newton's family have been subjected to unpleasant harassment, I will not identify them by name. Mr. Newton's sister turned out to be a lady of great dignity, the picture of respectability, but added to that a gentle, serene countenance. The uh, poor people, the Negro people, I mean, he always felt very strong about this and different things that happened, I'm sure is what drove him more to believe that something needed to be done about it. Was this a gradual progression to this, uh, to this Gradu stage? Gradually, you say? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I guess, yes, it wasn't a jumped up thing, if that's yes. what you mean. Yes, uh, yes, gradually all, all along, like I say, you know, he um, thinks of the betterment of a man, things that need doing. He believed you should get up and do something about it. Uh, he always been this way, e even as a child. He liked sports, he liked music, and he's very interested in history. And I think in reading history and seeing how the world really is, is another thing that encouraged him. Do you feel that Huey stands any chance of having a fair trial? Sometimes I have hope, and sometimes listening, I doubt it. I, I can't see how it's possible. I, I don't feel, I hope he has more courage than I have, but feeling the way I feel about it, uh, I, me personally, it, it don't seem, up to this point it haven't gone fair. This is what I base it on. It haven't gone fair up to this point. So naturally, I don't have much hope for it going fair any further. It must be a very yeah. drastic thing to happen to any family. Yes, it is. Yes. My, my mother uh, is ill and my father is too. He tries to go on to work, but my mother can never make it to court. She says she comes in, but by the time, you know, I have to take it to what the doctor. What did your father do? He worked for the city of Oakland. Mm -hmm. yeah. My mother's housewife. Yes. Yeah. A quiet family, Negro family, yeah. and suddenly this happens yeah, to them. Yeah, my father's a minister, by the way. Is he? Yeah. Now, uh, some of the press here have been uh, branding uh, Huey and other leaders in the Black Panther Party as anti-white racists. Would you like to say something about Huey's attitude on this question? Uh, of course, she wasn't in court this morning, another lady. Uh, I wasn't allowed in. <laughs> oh, you wasn't allowed in. 
Anyway, she wasn't able. That's, that is Hugh's girlfriend, the girl of that. But before he met her, Hugh's girlfriend was a white girl. So this proved. Before that girl, she was a Filipino girl. So this proves that he has no qualm. He's not British at all. And my father is half white. So uh, this goes kind of far back, so we have no connection with the white family. But I mean, this would uh, kind of detour the British to. Mr. Newton's fiancée, an extremely attractive young black lady with classic features, is, like Mr. Newton himself, very musically inclined, and she has shown great promise as a singer. I asked her, too, about the anti-white label applied to Mr. Newton. As far as being anti-white, this is, um, you know, ridiculous. I think this is just uh, retaliation on the part of the system to... Uh, you know, try and knock the Panthers, to try and say that the Panthers are wrong, and to use any sort of devious methods against them. Uh, I, Huey has always expressed that he is anti-oppressor, and uh, I am anti-oppressor. Um, and I think that uh, any person that believes in right would be anti-oppressor. Not, it's not anti-color of any kind, it's just the oppressor. Well, Huey is, um, he's a very energetic person, dynamic, and very kind and gentle. Uh, for instance, every time he, he passes me, uh, although we're in the same house or in the same room, he'll say, hi, how are you doing, you know, or he, he you know, he's very considerate towards people. Mm -hmm. Did he, did he talk much to you about his, um, his future, his plans, his hopes? Well, we both believe that uh, this is just another obstacle and that it will soon be over. And uh, from there, uh, his future too much hasn't been mapped out, but I'm sure we'll be working on it. How do you feel about this trial? Do you think that he stands any chance of getting a fair trial? Um, as it stands now, uh, as far as fairness, I don't think that fairness is being displayed in the many things that have been brought up in the trial. I think that it's a deliberate attempt to railroad him. But I believe that because he is right, and I believe that he is innocent, and uh, I believe in him, that I think that things will work out fine. We look forward to them working out. Have you suffered any victimization or harassment of any sort uh, as a result of having been close to Mr. Newton? Well, calls to my job, my home, uh, being followed. Uh, being followed by whom? <laughs> I don't know, just men in cars, you know, and the, uh, just the, the regular intimidation process that they go through. But this, uh, I, because of uh, my belief in Huey and uh, in the philosophy of the Panthers, that I don't, um, I don't let anything like that bother me. Have you suffered any ostracization at all, for instance? You work in an office, do you? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you're a secretary, are you? No, I'm a counselor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you suffered any sort of reactions from people there as a result of this case or the whole Black Panther movement? Mm -hmm. Some. Uh, you work with white people, I take it? That no, is... I work with uh, primarily black people. Oh. Uh, I work with some white. And oddly enough, um, some of the ostracization came through uh, women black people, you know. Uh, I, should, I shouldn't say black people, I should say, in quotes, Negroes, unquote. <laughs> and, um, but I think that uh, everyone is just sort of resolved to the fact that uh, I'm with you and there's nothing that anyone can do about it. So they've sort of uh, swallowed it. Well, now let's meet Mr. Newton himself. He's a rather handsome young man a sort of darker-skinned version of Horst Buchholz or Warren Beatty. The photographs on the posters and pamphlets I've seen really do not do him justice. With me interviewing him in the cell were Mrs. Joan Didier, who is a Saturday Evening Post columnist, Mr. Ray Rogers of the Los Angeles Times, and Mr. Eldridge Cleaver, an editor at Ramparts magazine and himself a prominent figure in the Black Panther Party. 
Mr. Newton's attorney, Mr. Charles Gary, was also present, and he put in a question or remark once or twice. Copyright to this group interview belongs to the Huey P. Newton Defense Fund, without whose specific consent no reproduction or publication of Mr. Newton's remarks can be made. The next voice you'll hear will be that of Mr. Huey P. Newton. We ran into the problem of people misinterpreting uh, us as a political party. Uh, they use the word uh, for self-defense as a uh, as uh, they defined us then as a group that uh, were a paramilitary group or, uh, or uh, bodyguards of something of this nature. But um, we found that uh, it was very difficult, even in our program we described uh, or defined ourselves as a political party, but yet people uh, seemed to misinterpret the, uh, the definition of what self-defense is all about. Uh, we realize that uh, when we're assaulted in the community by the uh, Gestapo tactics of the police, this is also a political thing. Uh, we're assaulted because we're black people and because uh, the power structure uh, finds it uh, uh, to their advantage uh, to uh, keep us imprisoned in our black community and uh, as uh, a colonialized or a uh, colonial people are kept by uh, some foreign power. So um, the police uh, is only an arm of the white power structure used very similar as uh, their military force, which it is a military force. It's their uh, local police and you have the National Guard as the national police and then you have the regular military as the uh, international police. And um, these police are used to um, to occupy our community just as a foreign troop occupies territory. They don't live in our community, the police, and uh, don't, and um, they have no respect for black people who live in the community, yet uh, they occupy the community. Uh, and they're not occupying the community for the welfare and the benefit of the people who live there. They're occupying it to uh, make sure that the uh, businessmen who are systematically robbing our community are safe. Um, so this was one part of our political stand, and uh, to make to make the party uh, for basically for the intellectuals because the grassroots of the community, uh, the people who we're most concerned with, because uh, the lower class black who represents about 95 percent of the black population throughout this nation, uh, they understood very well what we stood for. Uh, but to make it clear to everyone, we changed the name to the Black Panther Party and uh, uh, to make it clear what our political stand was about. Mr. Newton, um, some newspapers and radio stations, television stations, uh, sort of brand the Black Panther leadership, you and Mr. Seal and others, as anti-white racist, sort of counter-racism. Would you like to clear up this matter? Uh, yes, that, uh, the Black Panther Party is against racism. We're not racist, but uh, we stand uh, to protect the black community and to rid America of racism. Uh, we're we're uh, subject to the tactics of racism by the white establishment, and uh, but it's a very uh, common thing for uh, the people who are in control of the mass media to define the victim as the criminal or to define the victim of racism as the racist. Uh, this is just a propaganda device that's used by the power structure so that uh, they will uh, gain support uh, throughout the white community who uh, a small portion of it uh, happen not to be racist. But uh, in order to uh, uh, consolidate their troops, uh, they will uh, claim that we want racism, therefore to turn uh, all white people against us. Have you uh, felt good about some young white people uh, sort of coming out in support of your case and uh, taking a political position on it? Uh, yes, the, the white revolutionaries or the uh, enlightened part of the white community has responded uh, and came to the defense of the black community and uh, have come to the defense of the vanguard group of the black community, which is the Black Panther Party, and that uh, we think we'll see more of this in the future. Talk for a moment about yourself, your life, you know, before the Black Panther Party. I think that uh, 
before the Black Panther Party, um, that my life was very similar to most black people in the country. I'm from a, uh, a lower class black family, a working, uh, uh, a working class family, and uh, I've uh, suffered the abuses of the power structure just as uh, uh, all black people in America have. And uh, I've responded and that uh, black people are responding now. So I see very little difference in my uh, personality than any other uh, black person living here in racist America. I mean, what, what shaped your, atti your, your attitude towards these, towards the institutions that you're, you're indicting? Um, living here in America, it, it reminds me of a, a quote that uh, from James Baldwin. Uh, he says that to, uh, to uh, be black, and conscious in America is to be in a constant state of rage. And uh, I think this is uh, very true of uh, black people in general in this country. Many black people, uh, uh, most black people, as I said, that are uneducated and uh, they're not used to handling academic things and uh, administrating. Uh, so their response might have been somewhat different than mine, but. Um, they will rally behind a political party that's uh, representing their grievance. So uh, all the Black Panther Party has done is to uh, articulate and bring out uh, the grievances of the black community. Can you think of some, uh, recall some incidents that sort of brought home to you the attitude of a majority of white people towards Negroes and the attitude of the black, of the white establishment? You like a specific incident? Uh, can, you know, people can bring home to people, you know, how this can scar one's soul. And I think you're trying to boil it down to one uh, statement. I don't think that could be it, it, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I can understand that. It's, it's very difficult for me to cite uh, one specific incident because uh, it's a very long uh, uh, process and that I started to say that uh, for a white person to understand, let him come to the black community. But this wouldn't be a good example because he couldn't experience the alienation and the, uh, the, uh, the antagonistic uh, attitudes of black, blacks that we receive in the white community. And we live in the white world, in the white, uh, white America here, and that uh, uh, any time a white person goes to uh, the black community or a black country, I doubt very seriously whether he experiences this uh, alienation because black people seem to um, have some, uh, some priority on, uh, uh, upon uh, being uh, humanist for some reason. Perhaps it's a uh, historical reason. That I can't uh, pinpoint why, but we seem to be uh, more fair as a people to other people than anyone else in the world. Have you had a chance to see this uh, President's Commission on the Civil Disorders report? Uh, I read a couple of accounts of it, yes. Do you think it's hitting pretty close to the mark? I think that some of the statements in the report uh, uh, hit the mark, but uh, as far as uh, the conclusion or the solution to the problem, I think uh, they were wanting in that, uh, in that direction. Do you think the uh, white establishment and the white people in the, as a whole will take it to heart and do something really effective to solve this problem of racism that it portrayed? Uh, <clears throat> I doubt seriously whether uh, white America is uh, mature enough uh, and mentally well enough to uh, solve this problem without uh, a, uh, a great uh, catastrophe. Are you optimistic about your trial and do you think it will be a fair trial? Well, I think that black people uh, will make very sure that I receive a fair trial. I have no faith at all in the, uh, in the court system because uh, I've already s suffered an injustice uh, uh, by being indicted by an all-white middle-class uh, grand jury. And uh, so from my prior uh, experiences uh, that I would expect for them to, uh, I would expect no change. But uh, I also expect black people to come to my aid and put pressure 
uh, and see by any means necessary that uh, all black men receive a fair trial. That's including those who are held in the various prisons and county jails at the present time. We're demanding an immediate release for them because we realize that they've suffered uh, the same kind of uh, injustice that I'm suffering now. You know, the Peace and Freedom Party uh, sought to have you run as their candidate in the 7th Congressional District. And we understand that you stated that if the Peace and Freedom Party would endorse the 10-point program of the Black Panther Party, then you would feel uh, free to run. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Uh, that's very true, that uh, the Black Panther Party feels that the essentials that we cited in our platform, the 10-point program, is necessary for any group to accept if we're going to work in coalition with them. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's the basic things that the black community, uh, the, uh, it's the basic demands of the black community. And without accepting the basic demands, uh, we would feel that uh, the person who is seeking coalition is insincere if he cannot accept these uh, uh, ten, uh, ten basic um, uh, philosophies. Points in the ten-point program um, is the uh, elimination of all black people from the draft, right? Uh, yes, that's part of it. Uh, we have a ten-point program of uh, what we want and what we believe, yeah. and that uh, we state that. Um, that uh, black people should not be made to fight in a war and uh, to fight, serve in a military and to serve a government that is not uh, working in our benefit and that's not working for our general welfare. That uh, if the government is working against black people and for the destruction of black people, we don't see any need at all for black people to serve in that military. Uh, that's oppressing us and other colored people throughout the world. So we uh, demand that all black men be released from the military service and not serve at all until this government uh, rightens the wrongs uh, that, been, that have been uh, perpetrated against us. Well, it's not, it's not an objection to uh, this specific war. It's an objection to, to our government, right? Uh, it's, a, it's an objection to the, uh, the specific war in particular and the government in general. We don't see where we would fight anyone uh, for this uh, racist government that's only uh, oppressing people for uh, economical reasons and race reasons as they're oppressing us in our black colonies throughout America. How do the uh, Panthers stand in relation to, to some black nationalist groups like Alan Kalinga and Watts say? What, uh, what is, um, is there any point of uh, where you come together? Uh, in the first place, that uh, the Black Panther Party is a political party. Uh, I don't believe that uh, that Ron Karinga claims to be a, a political organ. Uh, secondly, that uh, uh, Ron Karinga and other uh, uh, some other nationalist groups uh, seem to be somewhat hung up on a. Uh, surviving Africanisms or uh, what we call cultural nationalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, cultural nationalism deals with uh, a return to uh, the old culture of Africa and uh, that we would somehow become free by uh, identifying and returning to this uh, culture of Africa, say, uh, that was in the 1100s or before then. and. Uh, 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 somehow uh, they believe that uh, they will be free through identifying this manner. As far as we're concerned, we believe that uh, it's important for us to recognize our origin and to identify with the revolutionary black people of Africa and uh, uh, people of color throughout the world. But as far as returning uh, per se to the ancient customs, uh, we don't see any necess necessity in this. And also, we say that the only culture that's worth really holding on to is revolutionary culture or change uh, for the better and that uh, we say the only way we're going to be free is by seizing power, political power, which uh, comes through the barrel of a gun and uh, we say that um, we will identify so that uh, we will have this consolidation of people so we have strength 
and that uh, we will uh, uh, respect ourselves and uh, have the dignity of our past, but uh, many things uh, connected to the culture that uh, we don't feel it's necessary to return to. The Black Panther title and symbol was uh, introduced, I believe, by SNCC in Mississippi and Alabama when they started the Black Panther Party or movement down there. Was this what gave inspiration to the creation of the Black Panther Party here? Uh, yes, I, I was very impressed uh, by the uh, political party in Lowndes County uh, that calls itself a freedom organization, and they use the Black Panther as their symbol. And uh, they use the Black Panther uh, because of the, uh, the nature of a panther, that a uh, panther uh, will not attack anyone, that uh, he will back up first. But uh, if the uh, assailant is persistent, then the Black Panther will strike out and wipe out his aggressor thoroughly, wholly, absolutely, and completely. So we thought that uh, the symbol uh, would be uh, very appropriate for us and also that uh, we uh, were very, I was very proud of the uh, move that uh, the black people in Lowndes County made. Have you had any expressions of sympathy or support from overseas yet? That uh, at this time that black people all over the world are supporting each other, that uh, we realize that uh, we're being treated by the race of America within the country as other, as other uh, colonized people are treated abroad because for economical reasons, just as we are uh, uh, abused and also for race reasons. I would like to say that uh, communications are kind of bad uh, up here between Huey and the outside world. Uh, for instance, they impose restrictions on uh, newspapers and magazines that he could receive books and so forth that uh, would keep him informed on what's going on around the world. Very essential information. It, it, were he able to get a news from the outside, he would know that while Stokely Carmichael was in Africa, uh, there was a Free Huey rally held in Tanzania, and that uh, President Kwame Nkrumah and Sekou Toure have issued uh, public statements uh, to the effect that uh, Huey Newton should be set free. So that there is an awareness uh, news clipping and so forth are, are sent around the world and people around the world are aware of this case they're aware of the pivotal nature of the case and uh, i'm sure this will become public knowledge when people start checking it out if you are acquitted and set free uh, i presume you'll continue into a political clear have you thought of returning to law or are you now bound definitely onto a political career to change those laws by in the congress or in the state government uh, as far as a career, I have one desire, and that, that's to go on fighting for the liberation of black people uh, throughout the world, in particular, the black people here in America. Uh, I, w I would like to uh, relate to uh, the Black Panther Party and uh, our political stand that black people must arm themselves. I think that this has been uh, misinterpreted a number of ways uh, uh, many times that uh, we've made the statement or uh, quoted it from uh, Chairman Mao that political power comes through the barrel, grows through the barrel of a gun. And uh, the Black Panther Party has analyzed the statement and has uh, come up with the uh, clear realization that uh, any time a people are unarmed and the people and the administrators of that country maintain a regular police force and a regular military, those people, the people of the country, are either slaves or subject to slavery at any given moment. That that administration desi uh, desires uh, to inflict the force of their military or police upon the people. So we say that as long as the military and the police force are armed, then uh, black people uh, are, are, uh, <clears throat> uh, should arm themselves. And the many people who have spoken of uh, violence, well, uh, we're advocating violence. We're not advocating violence, but we are advocating that we defend ourselves from the aggression. And that uh, if uh, America is armed, then if it's right for America to uh, arm herself and even commit violence uh, uh, throughout the world, then it's right for black people to arm themselves. And then if it's wrong for America to uh, to uh, 
to um, commit this violence, then, uh, or if it's wrong for black people to commit this violence uh, in their own self-defense, then it's wrong for America to uh, commit this violence against people uh, in America and throughout the world. So uh, it's a uh, statement, it reminds me of a statement that uh, Ronald Reagan made uh, shortly after our appearance at uh, the Capitol, that uh, uh, he said something to the effect, or paraphrase, that, that uh, in this enlightened time that uh, people uh, cannot and should not uh, influence other people by the use of physical force and the gun. Uh, but at the same time that uh, we see throughout America the police uh, being heavily armed and now not only being armed but escalating the war against black people and our black communities by ordering heavy uh, military equipment. And uh, we think that uh, Reagan should take a look, of it, look at uh, what he's doing and what this American government is doing before he criticized black people for arming themselves to defend themselves against the aggression of America. But do you see yourself as playing a part, say, things uh, assume an orderly process now towards reforms, uh, playing a part in the political scene through the present political structures? I, I think that the present uh, political structure is bankrupt, and this is what the uh, the game is all about. That the pl the present uh, political structure has perpetuated and uh, protected racism, and inflicted uh, racism. Uh, so we say that uh, there has to be a drastic change in the political structure, as far as. Uh, my running for office that I would only serve one purpose there as a spokesman uh, to articulate the uh, grievances of the black community and as far as uh, uh, playing the game that uh, some black po politicians have uh, uh, traditionally played that uh, the day has come for this kind of action to uh, be over. For instance, this is one of the reasons that we feel it's necessary to arm myself in a political fashion. It's, uh, it's a very important thing. For instance, uh, when any um, uh, candidate is going up for political office, that uh, he always, in the white power structure, he always has political power behind him. And political power is, uh, you can find it in a number of areas. You have uh, uh, feudal power or the farmers who own uh, much land. And uh, of course, they will put a candidate up who uh, will um, serve their welfare and speak in their behalf. And uh, the other uh, uh, his uh, political colleagues, uh, the people he has to work with, uh, understand that he has his power behind him. For instance, uh, if the farmers don't get what they want, then uh, they'll let the crops ride in the field if they don't get the price, uh, what they want for the crops. And then you have uh, big uh, business power or economical power where the people who own big businesses will uh, get behind a candidate. And uh, this candidate uh, will simply uh, uh, relay the message of these uh, people who are in big uh, big business and uh, it goes on you have the the cattle owners and so forth and uh, we see that black people uh, are black people don't have uh, this political power they don't have economical power they don't have land power we've been robbed uh, for instance uh, our black uh, politicians have been ineffective not uh, much of the time it's not their fault, it's simply because they don't have the grassroots political organization behind them. Um, even if they get votes from black people, simply to have a vote doesn't mean political power. Uh, uh, in the political arena, uh, a thing is not political unless there's a, uh, a political consequence if the people don't get what they want. And uh, black people in the past haven't been able to offer this consequence. For instance, uh, uh, according to um, uh, John Hope Franklin, the reason that black reconstruction failed, where you had many black candidates holding offices in the South, wasn't because these black candidates were ignorant or uh, inefficient. Uh, many, of, many of the black candidates had been uh, educated in France and Canada, uh, in England, and uh, they were very efficient. But uh, the reason that it failed is because uh, there was uh, blacks did not have economical or military power. That uh, after they put their man into office, that uh, he was still subject to these people who owned the land. That he was still subject to these people who owned the military. 
Uh, so black reconstruction failed. And uh, we say now we can develop a political consequence, we can develop political power by being a potentially destructive force that uh, black people arm themselves in a political fashion, and then if uh, the aggression is continued against us, we'll be able to offer a political consequence, very similar to uh, Detroit. Uh, it's, it's quite a phenomenon going on in the black community these days. Uh, it's quite clear that while you were out, there were a lot of groups and people who opposed uh, your program and refused to uh, approve of the Black Panther Party. But since you've been in jail, a lot of people who opposed you have turned over and are now members of your party. Uh, also, it's becoming necessary for people to take a public stand on this issue because the black community is demanding that. Uh, one thing, they demanded that uh, Willie Brown, in particular, and all other uh, black elected and appointed officials uh, take a, a public stand. They asked the ones who are members of the legislature to stand up on the floor of the legislature and speak out in your defense. They're demanding that. And it's having a, a political effect because this is an election year. For instance, uh, John Miller and Byron Rumford are trying to run for the same office in Oakland, the 17th uh, Assembly District. Uh, Willie Brown is running again. And John George is seeking to be elected to Congress. And all these people have before them the whole question of where they stand on Huey Newton and not a meeting goes down without that coming up and I thought you might be interested in knowing that. Yeah. Would, would you expect that to happen? Uh, well, no, then I, I'm very surprised that uh, it did happen, but after it happened, then in retrospect, uh, I understand uh, what's going on. For instance, the black community is now forcing uh, these uh, political candidates uh, into uh, a direction that they want. Uh, they realize they depend upon black people to vote for them. And uh, black people identify with the Black Panther Party. And uh, they identify with the party more so now than they did in the past, even though we've had great, uh, a great reception from the black community in the past. And the reason for this, in my opinion, is that black people uh, are always impressed by a reality that you could talk all day and articulate all sort of beautiful things, you know, how things could be and how things are and describe it to the point and uh, you won't get the response uh, that you would um, that uh, when a reality is put before them. Uh, black people have understood what I've talked about and uh, now that uh, I'm being subject to these very things that I've criticized, they can sympathize uh, with the party on this. And also, it, uh, it makes them look around and observe. It brings to their consciousness uh, many things that are happening in the black community that are wrong, many things that people have spoke about, and uh, many things that people have uh, uh, suggested uh, change. And uh, they haven't responded to the, to the magnitude that they're responding now simply because this reality. You cannot deny a reality. And uh, anything that I've said in the past, um, if it didn't relate to the uh, situation, then it was my fault and it wasn't the situation's fault. So black people now are only relating to the reality of their existence. They, they realize that it's not only Huey Newton who's being persecuted, but it's the black community throughout America. And uh, they are responding in their own defense. There's been a lot of talk about the generational gap uh, in white families between the young people who are disillusioned with their parents and alienated from them. Is, is there a certain amount of this uh, among black families, and is this part of the problem you have in bringing more adult black people into the movement? Um, I, I think that uh, the older black people have realized uh, for a very long time the problems, but uh, as for a solution, they've been wanting in solution because the, uh, in the past the uh, black uh, political representatives have been uh, somewhat misleading the black community. In other words, that uh, it's been thought in the past that if you can put a, a, a representative into office, you will automatically get justice. But now it's been realized to have a black man in office doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get uh, uh, political justice. Was the reason you dropped your studies of law that you got disgusted with the system of law here? 
Um, of course, I'm disgusted with the uh, the uh, judicial uh, uh, system, but uh, more than that, that uh, I can only do so much, uh, I can only be uh, so many places at a certain time, and I felt it more important to work to organize within the community than to uh, continue uh, law school. Are you allowed to have any uh, contact with other prisoners at, in this courthouse here? Uh, no, I, I'm kept in uh, what's called the uh, H-Tank, and uh, it's used uh, as a hospital tank when someone is hurt. But uh, I've recovered very well, and I've noticed that I haven't been moved away from the, uh, the hospital cell. And I don't think uh, the deputies here have any intentions of moving me because they don't want me to, uh, it's been rumored that they don't want me to uh, mix with the other prisoners. Uh, many, uh, although I've converted many black uh, people, I shouldn't say converted be because black people are panthers anyway by the definition of the word, but uh, many people who join the party who've come through here simply by screaming back to my uh, cell and uh, I will uh, define the party and give them some understanding of the political direction of the party. Uh, I haven't been abused here uh, primarily for the reason that uh, the um, department uh, has been uh, admonished by the uh, black people uh, to uh, keep their hands off. For instance, when I first came here, uh, this is a rumor again uh, from a reliable source that uh, the, de uh, the captain uh, notified the uh, deputies not to, uh, uh, not to treat me any differently than other prisoners. So I haven't uh, suffered any brutality here. Um, the attitude of the uh, deputies have been somewhat hostile and uh, just yesterday, for instance, that I got into a um, uh, an, uh, somewhat of an argument with one of the deputies uh, for a very petty reason. And uh, the reason was this, that uh, the deputies here demand that when any prisoner addresses him, he, he should address him as sir or mister. And, uh, of course, uh, they address the prisoners as uh, by the prisoner's first or last name. Uh, I was asking uh, one of the deputies uh, something yesterday, um, and uh, he kept walking. Then he abruptly turned around and came back, and he said, whenever you uh, address me, you call me Mr. or you call me Sir. And uh, I told him very fine that I would do that. But in return, I would uh, demand uh, equal respect and that he would, uh, he would uh, speak to me as sir or as mister. And uh, he got very upset and he stormed out and uh, approached the lieutenant and uh, told the lieutenant his problem that uh, a prisoner wouldn't call him sir and uh, gave some indication that uh, he wanted to put me in the punishment cell where the, um, I was, incidentally, I was asking him uh, if I could shave um, <clears throat> because we don't have facilities within, within our tank to shave, we have to be taken to the barber shop. So uh, the lieutenant uh, then told him, and then this is a, a hearsay, that, uh, well, don't uh, take him until he says, sir. And uh, fortunately, another deputy came around and gave me a shave uh, because if he hadn't, it, I, would have, I, would, I would be forced to grow a beard down to my knees before I would... Uh, say sir if I wasn't given equal respect. Th th this is uh, only to relate an attitude, but as far as uh, uh, physical uh, brutality, I haven't received that. Why are you here? What can you do? Uh, well, occasionally um, I get the paper about a day late, or uh, I have a few books that I've been reading. It's pretty difficult to get reading materials in, um, but I have received a, a few books. So I spend most of my time reading and doing some writing. I wonder if you'd comment on something that struck me. Uh, lots of young uh, white people, young white people, especially from the middle class, have dropped out from the middle class way of life, but also from a lot of them from the activist Whoa. role. Uh, in, uh, this hasn't happened among young black people. They sort of, more or less, as a whole, uh, in general, uh, shunned the sort of the drift into uh, the dropouts, the marijuana, and everything like this. Can you account for this? <clears throat> uh, yes, that 
among the dropouts, I, uh, I uh, infer that you're speaking of the hippies yeah. and uh, hate Ashbury, and that uh, if you if you analyze the, the hippies or the hippie movement, you'll find that most of them uh, were uh, middle class uh, or members of a middle class family, uh, the upper lower middle class, and uh, these families have had uh, about every material thing that they could desire, and uh, also. Uh, this class have had the uh, the uh, opportunity to become uh, uh, well educated, and uh, through this they realize uh, how bankrupt the uh, the American system is, the government system, and that uh, as far as uh, as far as them participating in it, uh, they've chosen not to participate after their enlightenment. You see after their education and after they've analyzed the system. So uh, because they are in a state of dismay about change, because of the tremendous technology of this country sort of broke their spirit and they dropped out because uh, the country uh, has a great military and economical power and they've, uh, they've concluded that uh, they can make uh, very little change. So they've dropped out. Uh, black people in general are, are not middle class, that uh, we're ex socially and economically of the lower class, uh, and that uh, we haven't uh, received the basic things that we want because of the system, uh, because of a tremendous uh, 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 spirit, because of a great revolutionary fervor that we've had, that we've kept ever since we were brought here to this country uh, from Africa. Uh, we have not been broken, and we're still striving, and we uh, say that uh, our spirit is greater than the technology de technological developments, and that we, we can and will make changes. So uh, we uh, don't have time for anyone who's dropped out of the, uh, the struggle for freedom. Uh, there are a lot of people interested in uh, the executive mandate number three that you've issued uh, to the Black Panther Party. Uh, would you care to comment on that? Um, this was the, the mandate that uh, care come in on that? Um, yes, the, the, the uh, mandate number three are, is this uh, demand uh, from the Black Panther Party speaking for the black community. And uh, we uh, have, uh, within the mandate, we admonish the, uh, the racist police force that uh, if they continue to uh, break down our doors and be aggressive towards us and inflict brutality upon us, that uh, we will be forced to protect our home front, that uh, the par party members have experienced, uh, Bobby Seale, uh, the chairman in particular, have experienced the police breaking down the door and uh, coming into his house without a warrant and acting in a criminal fashion. And uh, we maintain the right to protect ourselves from criminals that when the police come in uh, to our house acting as a criminal, uh, he should be brought to justice uh, by the occupants of that house. And uh, because we, uh, in the mandate, we relate the, the, uh, the uh, Valentine's Day uh, massacre, that uh, gangsters dressed up in uh, police uh, uniforms under the leadership of uh, Al Capone, and that uh, because uh, they were dressed up in police uniforms, they were admitted into uh, the house uh, of these individuals who uh, turned out to be their victims. And uh, so in other words, just because a man has on a police uniform uh, doesn't uh, make him a representative of justice and representative, a representative of a peacemaker uh, or a peace officer, that um, he could be a, a wolf dressed in sheep clothing, and that uh, we really realize this and we would like the police to know that at any time they break down our door uh, uh, unjustly uh, without a warrant and without any uh, provocation whatsoever that we're going to defend ourselves against them. I think that covers it. Unless somebody uh, one last any. question. I, no, but are you and uh, other Black Panthers working uh, out a concept of what you'd like this country to be like, with some specifics of what will replace this system one day? Um, yes, that uh, the Black Panther Party, uh, you'll note, has demanded uh, full employment. Uh, we've demanded uh, uh, decent housing. 
uh, we've demanded uh, good education and uh, justice. And uh, we feel that this, uh, the, the system as it is, is uh, cannot give this to us. And we say that any time a man is born, the system, uh, the American capitalistic, uh, imperialistic system has never been able to employ all of, all of its people. And that uh, uh, particularly because of the, uh, the greed of the private owner uh, and the so-called free enterprise, we uh, know that uh, when the American uh, white people speak of free enterprise uh, that goes along with the idea of capitalism, that uh, they uh, assume that everyone has had the freedom of competition uh, to compete with the next fellow, and uh, it turns out the man who works hardest uh, will have the, uh, will benefit, will reap more. This doesn't hold true for black people, that when the move to the West where uh, this free enterprise was working uh, fairly well for white people, they were staking up land and the one that would, uh, uh, as we are now, we've, we've never been given a chance to participate in the so-called free enterprise. We built uh, this country because uh, the industrial system was built upon slave labor in the South and that uh, we made it possible for this country to industrialize and that uh, we say because we've never benefited by free enterprise and private ownership, then uh, we uh, could not uh, stand for this. This, this is not a, uh, a good goal for us. So we say that whenever a man is born on a soil, he has a right to live. Uh, and to live, that he's going to have to work. And uh, if, if he can't work because of some physical reason, then it's up to the administrators of that country uh, to support the individual because of his right to live. Now, if the, if the administration says that, uh, well, we just can't possibly employ our people, then we say that system has to be changed, and we say that we will put in new administrators who are really interested in the welfare of the people of the country. And uh, as far as the means of production, we say that if the, if the way the means of production are being handled now, if it's not working, then it has to change. If private owners can't give full employment, then we say that then the means of production be taken away from them, put in the people's hands. We'll have managers or administrators to run our production system for the welfare of uh, the people in general of the country. So we say that uh, this is the richest country in the world and that we're sure that the country can give it full employment if it wanted to. If, if uh, you didn't have the greed of private and racism in the country, tomorrow you could have full, uh, uh, full employment. Mr. Carmichael recently said that um, socialism does not suit the black people, communism doesn't suit the black people, but he omitted to say that capitalism doesn't suit the black people. Do you think uh, that is significant, or uh, from what you've said, I take it you don't think capitalism has served uh, the interests of the black people? Uh, uh, Prime Minister of the Black Panther Party, Stokely Carmichael, uh, said that uh, communism hadn't answered the problem of uh, black people because it didn't relate to racism. Uh, uh, he, he said that, uh, I remember him saying that uh, capitalism didn't answer the, the question either. Uh, perhaps I'm wrong on that, but as I read it, that uh, he said that capitalism did not answer uh, the need of black people. Now, I, believe he, I believe he said that it was irrelevant at this particular time. Uh, I don't think he was making a projected analysis of the subject. Matter. I bring this up because it's confused no, some no, people, no, and what, I think what, what clarification what is good. What I out is this. If you just, uh, if you uh, say that if you had a communist structure here in America, a communist structure without relating to racism, uh, communism relates to an economical system uh, that uh, the means of production will be in hands of the people and the people will put administrators up to run their uh, production machinery and there will be no profit, there will only be wages that will go back into the community and, uh, and uh, for the general welfare of the people. Now, if you just treat it uh, per se as communist, in this country, I would say that it wouldn't work. I would say until you get rid of racism, racism is a psychological thing uh, that, that stems all the way back to England uh, and uh, Europe uh, in general. That uh, when uh, the when the European met the African, and that.
that uh, I have some my own opinions about what happened uh, during that time or some conclusions that I've drawn about it. Uh, for instance, that uh, I think it goes so deeply uh, psychologically as uh, the, the difference and uh, the culture of the European, the difference in the culture of the African, and particularly in how the European uh, worship. For instance, the European had this uh, this one God that he said defined as all good, and he was uh, <clears throat> he was created in the image of this God, and of course God can do no wrong, and that. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, since he was God-like, he could do no wrong. And uh, as far as sexual drives and so forth, this had no place in God's mind, so therefore it shouldn't have any place in the European mind. And uh, because the European started to be sick then, because uh, this was a, a, a big deviation from the human nature, uh, sex drives, that uh, so he was looking for witches and it, uh, everything else to blame his own uh, uh, human nature on. And uh, he couldn't fall beneath the grace of God, so he would say that, you know, I'm not causing this within myself, so someone else must be. Then you have the contact with the African who had, uh, who always had uh, a God that was, um, that uh, was, uh, we call it dualism. Uh, and uh, in Europe, you had absolutism. And uh, in Africa, south of Sahara, uh, where most, from where most black people came, you have this, uh, you have dualism where the God has uh, two or more heads and um, one good head and one bad head and the African was created in God's own image and that uh, when uh, he was out of the good grace of the good head that uh, he would try to manipulate and get back in so that the bad head couldn't uh, do him any wrong but yet uh, he uh, recognized himself as both bad and good so he had self-acceptance and uh, he didn't need to put off his uh, human drives on other people when the European met the African, this was a good person for him to say that these people are vulgar, these people are, um, are, uh, are uh, pagans, and uh, every other kind of uh, derogatory word. So uh, this was, uh, it had nothing to do right at the present moment of any economical thing. It was strictly a difference in culture and a sick mentality of the European. And I say that you have the European coming to America here made up uh, the uh, the American colony, and he brought this uh, this uh, this psychological sickness with him. And uh, as far as an economical structure changing his sick mind, I doubt if this will happen. He needs uh, he needs a psychiatrist or some mental therapy. And I say that uh, as far as uh, economically, black people cannot profit by capitalism uh, within this structure. And that uh, as far as uh, socialism solving the problem per se and all together, I doubt seriously whether, whether it can. I believe that it can solve the economical problem. But as far as the, uh, the mental attitude, who is to say that after we choose these representatives that, uh, that uh, and everyone uh, is profiting, are supposed to profit by the, the, uh, the wealth or the materials that are in the country, who is to say that this even is not going to be dis uh, uh, handled in, uh, in a way of discrimination? So I say that any time we talk about a political or economical thing, we can't just uh, uh, dismiss the psychological part. You're looking for a more complete and fuller ideology, a more advanced one. That's right. It's true, is it not, uh, Huey, that uh, uh, racism got its birth through economic reasons so that uh, one group could superimpose its economic power over the other. That's I, I would agree with that. I, I think that uh, uh, a prime thing was the economical rape of Africa. But at the same time, why did the European choose uh, the African south of Sahara to enslave? Now, uh, some accounts I've read by Basil Davison and Melvin J. Herskovich uh, uh, stated, and it's on record, that the um, um, the priest are in Spain uh, said made a statement that uh, don't enslave those uh, African south uh, north of Sahara because uh, they worship one God and uh, but it's all right to enslave the Africans uh, south of Sahara because uh, they uh, they are pagans and they they're they're not humans they they lack a soul so uh, I'm saying that what has happened uh, they needed this this justification to uh, condone their political their economical exploitation 
exploitation, but this sort of ran haywire. After it, it started being embedded so that the economical structure could go on that uh, black people uh, uh, don't have souls are inferior. And now you run into a problem where that uh, it's handled uh, people who don't understand the economical situation has still been embedded with the value system that black is bad and black is uh, you uh, you uh, uh, black is evil. Thank you, Mr. Newton. The foregoing interview is copyright 1968 by the Huey P. Newton Defense Fund, without whose specific consent no reproduction or publication of Mr. Newton's remarks can be made. This is Colin Edwards.